Oh God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your risen word. We thank you for the evidence for your resurrection. We thank you for those disciples who took what they witnessed and witnessed to others, who witnessed to others and witnessed to us. And we thank you that you empower us to witness to you. Lord Jesus, would you speak to us this morning? Breathe the Holy Spirit onto us this morning. Send us out this morning. Lord, would you speak through me, and Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. I want to talk to you about doubt. Doubt. Did you know some Christians have some doubts? Some do. Some Christians have a lot of doubts. Some, I think I've met some Christians who never doubt in their whole lives. I don't know if I envy them or not. I know people who just seem always certain. Some Christians spend their lives riddled with doubts and somehow struggle through. The most difficult form of doubt is when we have doubt and we feel we have to hide it. Uh, we hide it so that we don't upset other people. We hide it so that we don't undermine somebody else's faith. We, we hide it because we're embarrassed. And then you can get to a point, and I think I've seen this happen, where you have this doubt explosion where people say, I've been a Christian 30 years and now I don't believe anymore. And I think it's important how we, as Christians, deal with doubt. And I think the message from our passage that Charles read for us earlier, the message of Thomas, the events that happened to Thomas, is to show us how strong a building block doubt can be in the growth of our faith. How much doubt can actually make us stronger. So I'll tell you about my doubts. I've got a list. No, I won't go through all my, all my doubts. I'll tell you about my, my journey. So I, I gave my life to Jesus when I was seven years old. I was in a caravan. Do you have caravans in this country? You heard of those? Oh, it wasn't a, yes, a trailer. That's it. So we were having a, a caravan holiday. And my mum said to me, if you don't give your life to Jesus, you're going to go to hell. And I was seven years old, and it didn't take me long to think this through. I said, Mommy, I want to give my life to Jesus. <laughs> I remember that, and I don't think there was a lot of doubt involved on that occasion. I, I, got, I got older, and uh, do you know that sort of low teenage age where you start asking questions, you start showing interest, you start wanting to see evidence? I did a lot of that somewhere around 11 or 12. Then I was given this book on the Holy Spirit. And uh, I read it in bed, in my bedroom. And the important part for me is at the end of the book, it said, you can receive the Holy Spirit. It said, confess your sins, give your life to Jesus, and invite the Holy Spirit to come upon you. It seemed very simple. I did it, and I had the most amazing experience of the love and peace of God. I had this experience of the Holy Spirit, which stayed with me through all those years, those teenage years where you kind of wish you weren't a Christian. Do you know those bits where you, you have points where you could walk away from church and faith, and that single experience and its continuation was this kind of doubt cure at that point. Then I got to about 16, and I began to be more exposed to, to the normal world. Do you know where you, you go to a, we call it a sixth form college, 
that's when you're 16, 17. Then I went to university, and you meet people from all sorts of different backgrounds, all sorts of different beliefs. You begin to be challenged by what other people believe and how other people live. That kind of chipped away at the way I believed. And then at 23, the Church of England, in its wisdom, decided to pay for me to go to university all over again. They selected me for ministry, and I went to do a theology degree. Now, there's different types of theology degrees. There's theology degrees you can go to Bible college, and they teach you the Bible. And then there's a type called sort of more theology and ministry, where they teach you how you apply theology. And then there's kind of straight academic theology, which in my experience seems to be taught only by people who don't believe. There were some people who believed a bit, and there were some people who, who tried hard, and they were, they were, mostly, it seemed to be ministers who'd done intense academic research, lost their faith, and then decided they'd go and teach other people to lose their faith. There was a, a kind of culture in this university of, if you believe it, you're probably not looking at it objectively which is about as logical as getting somebody who hates sport to be a sport pundit. Can you imagine? We actually watched some hockey, ice hockey, last night. <laughs> they move around very fast. That's, that's my impression. Anyway, can you imagine the guys that sit there in the tie and they, they, they give their opinions? And if that person was just said, oh, I, I hate hockey. It's rubbish, isn't it? I, I just think it's a complete waste of time. And my opinion is maybe if he'd moved a bit quicker, he might have scored. D you wouldn't do that, would you? You wouldn't get somebody with no passion for hockey commenting on hockey. Well, in the academic theology world, that's what they do. And, and I feel like maybe I approach this with some naivety. Because there I was, 23, you go to university thinking you're going to go and learn more about God. You're going to get deeper with God. You're going to learn the Bible backwards and forwards and sideways. And it's going to be great. And they worked us incredibly hard. A lot of work. Lots and lots of essays were written. They made us learn Greek. And lots of information was put into my head. But so much of it was undermining to my preconceptions. Do you know the things you learn at Sunday school that you just take as normal? They say, oh no, he didn't write that book. That book of the Bible shouldn't even be in the Bible. That thing didn't really happen. They say it happened, but it didn't really happen because you can... And after a few years, they had really, really changed faith. I was at the point where I was supposed to be seeking curacies about ordained, and I was thinking, how can I say this is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God, when you're telling me probably wasn't written by a prophet, probably wasn't written when they say, probably means something selfish and aggrandizing. How can I do this? And God sent me Canadian. Isn't that great? So I was really kind of, this, this wonderful education the Church of England paid for entirely uh, had really kind of made it difficult for me to get ordained. And, and I was drifting a bit. And at my college, the college I went to was a good Christian college, but it was the university I was studying at. They had these special lectures, which I never used to go to. I, I didn't really think they were that kind of clever. Anyway, they had this special lecture that took two hours, and it was given by Gordon Fee. Have you heard of Gordon Fee? He wrote a book called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. And this, this was his lecture. And uh, he, I believe, was sent to me by God. Because it wasn't that great a lecture for everybody else. But for me, he struck the nail on the head for each bit that I had a loose point in. He showed how each of the writers of Scripture knew and believed they were writing Scripture, how the people who received Scripture knew it was Scripture, how Scripture comes from God to us as a witness to Christ. And it was bang, 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 all in two hours. Suddenly, all this knowledge I'd filled my head with ceased to be destructive to my faith and became really a foundation for my faith, really useful to me. And for me, I feel like that was a going through the test, do you know? Going, uh, going through the fire 
of being tested with all of that doubt. And at the end of that, I felt stronger for it. I hope I'm stronger for it. I felt like I could speak to the people who scoffed at faith, for the people who said, oh, you think that, but really, you know? I felt like I was able to answer those questions, and I'm very grateful to God for taking me through that process. And that is what I want to think about this morning, what I want us to look at, to think about how doubt can be a building block in our faith. See, it is a wonderful thing that the gospel writer included Thomas's doubt. He could have left it out. I wonder if, when John was writing if he felt tempted, you know, just to go with the positive, just to say, Jesus rose, everybody believed, the world saved. Maybe he could have stuck with that. But it is important for us to know that some doubted, that their faith was tested, their faith was proved, that people way back then were not gullible and susceptible, they cared to search for evidence, they cared to prove their faith. At this, the most important moment in world history, at the resurrection, followers of Jesus were eager to establish the facts. And in our faith, in our faith, it is all right for us to ask questions. It is good for us to verify details. It actually can strengthen our faith by allowing ourselves to wonder, to question, and then to find reasons. Now, somebody taught me once there were three pillars of faith. I've tried looking this up, and nobody else seems to have heard of this. But I was taught the three pillars of faith are Scripture, reason, and the Holy Spirit. God has given us his word as a witness to his work. He has given us the ability to reason so that we may understand. And he gives us the Holy Spirit to lead us in truth. So let's go back to the beginning of the passage, the very beginning. Chapter 20, verse 19. It is still Easter Sunday. Peter and John have seen the empty tomb. Mary Magdalene has seen Jesus and gone back to tell the disciples. Did they believe her? Were they convinced by her, by what she said? Don't know. What we do know is the disciples are scared. They have locked themselves in for fear of the Jews. They have had a traumatic few days. On Thursday, they had supper with Jesus. The next day, they saw him killed. They finished their meal. They went to the Mount of Olives. Armed guards came. They arrested Jesus. He was tried at night. He was scourged. Then he was crucified. These things are frightening. This is a traumatic, frightening series of events. The disciples must be reeling with the shock. They spend Saturday in a state of shock and nervous anticipation. Early on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene has come to tell them that Jesus' body has gone. Then she tells them, he is alive. They remain together for the rest of the day. On the evening of that day, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. He showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus commissioned them, As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Then Jesus anointed them. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. He told them they had the power 
to forgive. Thomas was not with them. For a whole week he said, I will not believe it. They are all there. All these disciples are there saying, we have seen the Lord. And Thomas, for seven days, says, unless I see nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. It's rather gruesome, isn't it? What's he thinking? He wanted proof, physical proof. Seeing is believing. So a whole week later, they're in the house with the doors locked again, And Jesus came, stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he turns to doubting Thomas and says, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas says to him the most faith-filled thing in the whole Bible. My Lord and my God. Thomas is the first disciple to call Jesus God. Out of his doubt came total faith. And Jesus then points out to him, that the luxury of seeing him physically is not given to many. And he says that we are blessed, us. We are blessed when we believe without seeing. Out of doubt came faith. The disciples were locked in the room because they were not confident. They had doubts. Then they saw Jesus. Thomas declared his doubts, then he saw Jesus, then he believed. We too can have doubts. Some of them, sometimes maybe we shout too much about. Maybe we are too loud about some of our doubts. Some of them, probably, we cover over too much. Jesus is strong enough for your doubts. Thomas made his doubts very public. He addressed his doubt and he was given proof. As a church, we should have the maturity to address doubt, to answer questions. So we'll go back a bit further. How did the disciples respond when they saw Jesus? Anyone remember? The disciples saw Jesus and they were overjoyed. The disciples were overjoyed. And it is really important they were overjoyed. You'll remember when Jesus' mother, Mary, saw the angel Gabriel. I know we've just slipped to Christmas. Back at Christmas, she sees the angel Gabriel. What was she? She was afraid. And when Mary Magdalene and the two disciples on the road to Emmaus saw Jesus, they did not recognize him in the garden of Gethsemane as well. But the disciples, when they see Jesus, they were overjoyed. They did not only see Jesus, they knew it was Jesus. Can you imagine being there? It might have been a different circumstance. Do you know, if, if we saw somebody we loved rise from the grave, We might find that spooky, scary. If we were simply to imagine this just happening, it would be ghoulish. But that was not what this was like. The disciples were overjoyed. They did not share a confused moment. They didn't say, did you see that? What do you think that was? Do you think maybe that might have been Jesus? No, it says, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace 
be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. They were sure that it was him. When the women in Luke's gospel tell the disciples that angels have told them that Jesus has risen, the disciples don't believe them. They say, oh, it's nonsense. When Thomas is told that the others have seen the risen Lord, we know that he doubted because he had not seen it with his own eyes. But when these disciples see Jesus, they were sure they had seen him, and they were filled with joy. They were sure that the man they had known for three years, whom they had followed and lived with, whom they had seen killed, was standing with them, and they were overjoyed. This is key to understanding Christianity. People can cast doubt on so many areas of faith. They can find alternative explanations for so many things. But an area where it is very hard to find an alternative explanation is the faith of the disciples. It is hard to explain away the passionate and committed faith of the disciples. Just think what the disciples went through. These men, these followers of Jesus, saw their leader brutally killed. In any other circumstances, you would expect them to give up, to disperse, to run away. In normal circumstances, you would expect they would lose heart or maybe go and follow someone else. These men did not give up. They went on to be persecuted. They went on to be murdered. They went on to cause faith in Jesus to spread over the entire world. What is the explanation of their faith? What is the explanation of their perseverance? What other explanation can be found for their continued commitment to Jesus? They did not make themselves wealthy. There were no private jets among the disciples. They did not gain power. They suffered and sacrificed themselves. Why? Because they had seen the risen Jesus and been empowered by his Holy Spirit. Not half sure, not hedging their bets, but absolutely certain, certain unto death. This moment in their lives is key to understanding their faith. This moment is essential to understanding Christianity. And in this momentous, life-changing moment, Jesus says five things to them. It's only about three verses. He says five things. Peace be with you. That's one. Two. The Father sent me. Three. So I am sending you. Four. Receive the Holy Spirit. Five. If you forgive, they are forgiven. The meaning and consequences of Christ's life and resurrection are here. Jesus is the Son of God. He brings peace. His resurrection enables forgiveness, enables the empowering of the Holy Spirit and gives us a task to perform. This is what the resurrection means for us. It's really quite wonderful that the first thing Jesus says to them is peace. That's the first word Jesus chose to say to his disciples. He could have appeared and said, run! He could have said, hide! He might have said, get busy! He could have said, you guys really let me down. You failed me. You ran away. You didn't bother to remember what I told and taught you. He doesn't. They have seen 
violence and conflict. They are scared and hiding behind locked doors. Jesus appears to them and says to them, peace be with you. So the resurrection speaks to us of peace. Jesus has defeated death, sin, and the devil. This gives us peace. Gives us temporal peace. In that the, the conflicts around us, the conflicts of men, the politics, the wars, the persecution, must be seen in a new light. These things will happen. But we know that beyond these things, Jesus has beaten evil. It gives us personal peace in that death has lost its sting. Jesus has given us eternal life. Jesus' resurrection is the first fruit. So when we consider our own death, we can have peace. And the resurrection gives us spiritual peace. We do not need to be scared of sin. We have been forgiven. We do not need to be scared of the devil. He has been defeated. We are set free to be at peace. Peace be with you. The resurrection gives us this new peace. Jesus then says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. The resurrection makes all the sense it makes because the Father sent him. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God. He is sent to achieve this change. It is because of who Jesus is, and what he was sent for, that the resurrection achieves anything. The resurrections. Lazarus' resurrection. That was a mighty miracle, but it did not change the world. It was the Son of God, God, rising from the dead, that changes the world, that brings a new covenant that revolutionizes God's relationship with humanity. And this closeness of relationship, this being sent by God, this being a part of God's plan for the world, is in some part passed on to you. It is passed on to us. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. You have a role in God's plan. We have a task in the coming of the kingdom. We are the body of Christ. We are not merely to passively wait for his return. It's not about sitting back and putting your feet up. Our role here is not merely to decide whether we believe or not. We are sent out into the world as witnesses to his resurrection and all that his resurrection affects in the world. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. And then Jesus empowers them. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. We will hear more of the effect of the empowering of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. For now, we see that Jesus did not intend to leave them alone. He gives them the message. He tells them their task. He empowers them. He gives us the message. Our task. He empowers us. And then he tells them if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive, they are not 
forgiven. Now, I guess we all know that this verse caused all sorts of controversy in the church through history. Over the last couple of thousand years, the church has managed to misinterpret and reinterpret and do odd things with this. But let's, this morning, here, focus on the key meaning. Forgiveness. Jesus has come back from the dead. The disciples are surprised and delighted. His resurrection is about peace and working for God and empowerment and so importantly, forgiveness. Jesus died as sacrifice for our sins so that we can be forgiven. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's what it's all about. We have fallen so far away from God, from the way God wants us to be, so far that God gave himself for us to be forgiven. Romans 3. All have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Romans 3, 23 to 26. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. God gave Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins because he loves us. It annoys the life out of me when people talk about this being cruel. Have you ever heard anyone say that? How could, how could God be so cruel to Jesus to do that? Someone has called the sacrificial substitution of Jesus cosmic child abuse. Oh, that's annoying. Jesus, God's son, died on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. We use this language because it's the best way to understand it. But Jesus is God. God gave of himself for us. The God, the creator of all the world, loves the world. That is an amazing and remarkable concept. God loves us. And he gave himself. He died for us so that no more sacrifice would be necessary, so that we can be forgiven, so that we can relate to him, so that we can receive eternal life, so that we can learn to love. If I was going to invent a religion, I could not do better than this. That's how I'd like to make one if I was really clever and full of God's love. That's how I'd like to make it. Everything has a purpose, and that purpose is love. Now go and do it. Jesus commissioned his disciples, Jesus commissioned his church to be witnesses of his resurrection, to share his peace, to do his work. He gave them the Holy Spirit, and he sent them to proclaim forgiveness. Let us tell the world the good news. We can be forgiven. Our almighty creator loves us. Life is not meaningless. We are not a pointless collection of atoms going nowhere. We are created and redeemed by the loving heavenly father who does not leave us alone. He wants us 
to be in a relationship with him. He wants us to love him and to be loved by him. He has a task for us and he will empower us in it. Alleluia. Jesus is risen. Amen. Let's pray together. The risen Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your peace. Lord, if there are people here not feeling your peace, not knowing your peace, send your peace now. Lord. Stand among us. Speak to each of us. Say, peace be with you. We receive your peace, Lord. We thank you for your peace, Lord. Send us out. Send us out as you were sent out. Commission us, Lord. Show us the work you take us to, you lead us to. Breathe on us, O oh Lord. Breathe your Holy Spirit on us. Come, Holy Spirit. Empower us for your work. Inspire us for your mission. And Lord, help us to forgive. Where we fail to forgive, Lord, empower us to forgive. Teach us to forgive. We love you, Lord. Empower us and send us out. In Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen.